pass to Michael to introduce our speaker. Okay, so um, Frederike recently completed her PhD on hyperspectral imagery at the German Research Center for Geoscience GFZ in Potsdam, Germany. She is currently based in Norway, uh, working in the High Specs Division of Norse Electro uh, Optic SA. This firm is the industry leader for both airborne and ground-based hyperspectral imaging and the manufacture of advanced electro-optical products. Frederike is also the co-author, the co-founder of Rad Data Spectral Analytics, uh, co-developing their automated knowledge-based feature detection and analysis algorithm, Resense Plus. So I am personally looking forward to hear Frederica's insights on the talk it, topic. So please, Frederica, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so as already mentioned, I want to give you a little introduction today to hyperspectral imaging and how it can be applied in the mining environments. And the slides that I'm going to show are from projects from the German Research Center for Geosciences and the University of Potsdam, as well as um, case studies from high specs. There we go. Um, I just wanted to give a little introduction to hyperspectra um, because I am aware that most ore geologists uh, might have heard a little bit about it, but are usually not as familiar with it. So we're going to go a bit into the different platforms and instruments and then the different active minerals and the wavelength ranges that we're looking at. And then I want to go through two different use cases um, and case studies. One is in the Republic of Cyprus and one is in Nevada where we have the Kubrite Nevada um, alteration zones. Um, I'm aware that I have 30 minutes. I tend to speak very fast. I'm trying to slow that down, um, but I hope that won't really give me over the timeline. So if I'm over going over my time, please let me know, okay? Um, so just a first intro to spectroscopy. Um, solar optical reflectance spectroscopy refers to the study of light as a function of wavelength. You can see a typical reflectance spectrum here, and that is a plot of intensity of reflection versus the, or as a function of wavelength. Um, reflectance spectra are caused by the absorption, transmission, and reflectance of the incident light at a material or mineral surface or within a mineral. And um, different minerals and materials absorb photons by a different variety of processes, and those processes are wavelength dependent. In general, um, a mineral can be identified by the position and shape of, a, of its absorption feature, um, shown in green here, and they can be semi-quantified by the depth of this feature, shown in red here. Um, there are different processes um, causing or yeah, causing these absorptions of photons, and here we're working in the visible to near infrared from 400 to 1,000 nanometers, and in the shortwave infrared from 1,000 to 2,500 nanometers. In the veneer, we're usually seeing the absorption features from transition element bearing um, oxides or hydroxides and also from rare earth metals uh, and elements. And in the sphere, we're seeing um, hydroxyl bearing um, silicates, uh, carbonates and sulfates. So generally in the veneer, we're looking for iron bearing uh, materials, hematites and goethites, for example. And um, usually neodymium is used as a pathfinder for other uh, occurrences of rare earth um, minerals. And then in the sphere, we can see the different alteration um, materials and alteration zones, um, usually dominated by um, kaolinite or montmorinite and muscovites. And we can see the different triopterhedral silicates like chloride and um, actinolite. And then we also look at carbonates and sulfates here. Apart from the mineral content, there are different factors influencing the spectrum especially when we go from, um, from a lab-based setup with a very high um, spectral and spatial resolution to, for example, an outcrop setup where we have more influences by atmospheric changes and influences by surface changes and changes from um, topography, for example. And those factors that can also influence the spectrum are, for example, changes in particle size, um, changes in mineral mixture, in viewing geometry, surface roughness, coatings, and also water content. And that's all something that we should take into account when we look at um, 
data from outcrops or from UAV, for example. Um, as I already mentioned, not all minerals are active in the Venia and Sphere um, wavelength ranges. Some of them are active in the longer um, wavelength ranges, so in the um, Elvir, and um, especially the rock forming uh, minerals like feldspars and quartz are not really active in the Venian sphere. Um, in the Venian sphere, we are usually mapping carbonates, hydroxides and sulfates, oxides and phyllosilicates. And all of this is just to show that here we're concentrating on mapping alteration zones and we can see the different um, minerals that would represent these alteration zones, but we're not actively or directly mapping sulfites, for example. So pyrite or chalcopyrite, they're not active in the Venian sphere, so we can't really detect them. <clears throat> and this is just a short version of a table from Kopnik et al. in 2019 with a very good review of the whole topic. So I would, if you're interested in that, I would definitely recommend this paper. Um, as for the position of hyperspectral within the mining flow sheet, I just wanted to give a little overview of where it can be used and how it can be used. Um, and we're also hinting at the different platforms here. So um, hyperspectral imagery can only see the surface of the material. So we're always doing a surface analysis and the penetration depth is approximately half the wavelength, which means with a wavelength up to 2,500 nanometers, get a maximum of 1,000 nanometer of penetration depth. So we're not really um, doing any subsurface um, predictions or anything. We're looking at the surface and by doing that, we can either help um, a separation at the uh, mine front. So it could be a close to phase sorting or an early waste rejection. It could be a management for um, the different stockpiles and diverting material streams into the um, right areas within the mine um, early on. It could be a reclaiming and remining of tailings. Um, so we usually expect some surface changes on the tailings. It can tell us something about asset forming potential or pH, and those can be detected um, with hyperspectra as well. And then within the processing, we can also look at um, process monitoring. So the monitoring of resource input like water and reagents, or it could be um, actually monitoring the product quality. So there's a lot of different areas within mining where hyperspectral can be used, and it can be used either in um, a field setting, so from a tripod or UAV, or it can be used by um, being part of the industrial um, production line and conveyor belt setups. Talking about the different pl platforms, and I, I wrote hyperspectral platforms here, but we're also including super and multispectral in here, and I'm going to tell you what the difference is in the next slide. Um, this is just to show that when we look at the different platforms, we usually have to keep in mind what spatial resolution is interesting for us, what spectral resolution we need, and what time, what kind of temporary revisit time do we need? So does it have to be a very frequent monitoring? Do we need daily or um, uh, bi-weekly or uh, weekly um, analysis? All of that has to be taken into account when choosing the platform that you want to uh, use within your operation. Um, in general, the different camera developers, some of them have fixed lenses, some of them have lenses that can be adjusted. So for high specs, you can adjust the lenses for the different cameras that you're using. That means that um, you're not, you, you can change the distance from your camera to the target um, for the different camera systems um, by changing the lenses. So you're still able to get a sharp image when you're 10 meters away or when you're 100 meters away. And um, that's very interesting when you want to compare lab setups with what you're scanning or samples in the lab with what you're scanning in the field. Um, so these five are the general platforms that we're talking about. So it's either um, lab mounted, it can be mounted to a tripod, it can be mounted to a UAV, an aircraft or a satellite. Um, the distance from target to camera usually um, defines how big the pixels are that we're seeing and how um, the spatial resolution is. From aircrafts, we would expect something like two to five meter resolution. And from a UAV, it can be um, centimeters to several decimeters. Um, all of that is important when you want to see um, smaller incremental surface changes or when you want to focus on bigger alteration patterns. Um, usually in mining, we see um, a lot of exploration efforts being done using satellites, um, typically ASTA. And here we have something like 30 meter of um, 
pixel resolution. That's just to keep in mind that what we're seeing here will only be larger patterns um, without a lot of fine detail. Um, just to show you the spectral resolution and how that differs. Um, so I would divide it into hyperspectral, superspectral, multispectral. Multispectral is um, defined by um, measuring the incident light in broad um, bands and a small number of bands. And you can see the bands here in green. We can see that one band actually spans um, a couple of or up to a hundred of uh, nanometers. And this is an example for Sentinel-2, the Copernicus Sentinel-2 um, cameras and satellites. And in green, you can see that this spectrum doesn't give us a lot of information. It's able to give us a good overview of what the material looks like, um, but we lose a lot of information, especially in the sphere. And then on the other hand, we have hyperspectral, and that's characteristic for um, collecting the incident light in um, very narrow, consecutive, and a large number of bands. And this allows us to get a lot of information and a lot of um, spectral resolution. You can see in the blue spectrum here that uh, we are able to actually identify this double feature in around 2,220 nanometers, and we see um, very narrow bands and very fine differences in the spectrum. And an intermediate be between the hyperspectrum and the multispectrum would be a superspectral camera that has usually between 15 to maybe 100 bands. Um, and collects light um, in specific wavelength ranges. And here, the Worldview 3 camera is a good example for a commercial satellite, um, where we have more information in the sphere than with Sentinel, and usually um, a spec spatial resolution of 4.7 meters or something close to that. Yeah. So going into the hyperspectral data acquisition, just so you get an idea of how the data is actually acquired, um, I wanted to go let me just open this completely. Just um, another idea of how can this be implemented in the mining environment, not only in the flow sheet. I talked about exploration already. Here we usually use um, spaceborne or airborne cameras um, where we can see this broad patterns and can target down on um, some areas that might be interesting or have a more targeted drilling program. And then we have active mining monitoring that's done um, by UAV or by tripod. And it could either mean um, monitoring of um, stockpile or could be monitoring of tailings and can also be monitoring of um, mine faces. And then um, our smaller scale um, closer range um, cameras can be used for sampling in the laboratory or from conveyor belt settings. And I'm concentrating in this talk on this active mining monitoring site with either tripod or UAV. Um, just as I mentioned already, the high specs instruments actually have exchangeable lenses, which means you can use them in the setup or setting that they were built for, but they can also be adjusted and used in different setups. And um, we have the classic series, which was built for laboratory um, setups, so very high spectral and spatial resolution. Um, but can also be adjusted for field and airborne setups and can be mounted in an airplane or on a tripod. And the same goes for the Mjolnir, which is the dedicated UAV line. So this can be used in field setups but it, and UAV, but it can also be mounted on a tripod or even used in the laboratory with exchangeable lenses. And then for industrial setups, we have a line that is uh, looking more at these high pace environments um, like conveyor belt setups. And um, here you can see the setup that we had at the GFZ in Potsdam, the German Research Center for Geosciences. and um, the hyperspectral cameras are usually line scanners, which means to acquire the full image, the camera has to move relative to the area of interest. And for lab setups, that's usually done by moving the samples line by line underneath the camera with a translation stage. And the both two cameras here are mounted um, in the setup and we actually place the samples underneath. And we also include a wide reference panel, um, which is used for calibration of the data and uh, reflectance, absolute reflectance retrieval. A good thing about this um, kind of measurement is that the samples do not have to be um, changed from natural state. They can be sampled and scanned as is. That is um, particularly interesting if we want to apply the modeling that we do on those samples to the outcrop, where we know we have um, changed surfaces, we have different um, coatings, um, and we have these alteration surfaces and um, 
yeah, things on the top of our surface or our um, outcrop that might not be a representative for the bulk sample that we could look at with geochemistry. Um, and in the field, um, we actually move the camera uh, relative to the outcrop that can either be done by mounting it on a motorized rotation stage or it can be done by mounting it on a UAV. And this is an example from a Pliki mine in the Republic of Cyprus where the um, scanners were mounted on a tripod and then the stockwork um, was scanned in a rotational manner. And when we look at the UAV setup, um, that just means that the camera is flying over the area of interest and acquiring the image line by line. And then it's corrected for atmospheric influences and corrected for um, any other um, influence that we can have from um, flying like vibration. Okay, so I'm already going to go into the two case studies that I want to present to you. And the first one is the case study um, of Apliki mine in the Republic of Cyprus. This is from my PhD project, and um, it's been conducted with the GFZ in the University of Potsdam and also the Geological Survey Department of Cyprus. Um, just to give you some overview or setup or setting um, to set the stage. <laughs> so um, the Cyprus sulfide deposits are the mafic type of volcanogenic massive sulfides. And here, um, the metal sulfide ore deposit is formed in a submarine environment, which is associated with hydrothermal events. Um, in this case, we are in the super supra subduction zone fork setting of the Trodos ophiolite complex, and we're expecting um, hydrothermal wall rock alteration. Um, here, we are actually expecting, or in Cyprus, we have these three different graben systems that run approximately north, northwest, south, southeast. And we are in the Sulea graben here, shown with the rec red rectangular. Um, and we're looking at the Apliki deposit um, in the west. And I'm also going to show one example from the Skuritissa mine um, in the east of this um, zoomed in window. And the expected mineralization here is of pyrite, chalcopyrite, and sphalerite, with inclusions of galena and secondary copper bearing minerals like chalcosite. And the alteration is dominated by silica and chloride with disseminated pyrite. And as I already mentioned, um, none, none of these are actually, or well, none of the expected mineralization, pyrite, chalcopyrite, sunrite, are active in the Venian sphere spectral range. So what we're looking for and what we're mapping with hyperspectra here would be a mixture of the secondary iron minerals and the mineralization that characterizes the alteration, like chloride, kaolinite, smectite, for example. Um, just to zoom into uh, a Pliki mine a little bit closer, um, here we have a typical Cypress type deposit. We have an oxidation zone, which is um, overlaying a stockwork type sulfide mineralization. And this is um, within chloride bearing silicified lava. And all of this is hosted within the lower pillow lava complexes of um, Cyprus. Um, here we have a fault bound zone between the lower pillow lavas with a uh, mineralization of approximately 100 meter of um, width. And the copriferous um, massive sulfide has been mined out in the 70s. The reported grade there was between 1.6 to 3.5 weight percent of copper. And um, within the stockwork mineralization, so in the stockwork zone that you can see um, northeast of this little lake, um, the prevailing alteration is chloratization. And that is um, split up into three different zones of um, smectitic, chloritic, smectitic, and more chloritic um, zonation that we're expecting here. Um, I want to go into the workflow a little bit without concentrating on the specific algorithms or analysis types. And there are plenty, it kind of depends on what questions you want to ask the data. Um, just to give you the workflow a little bit is, um, we're starting with the data acquisition, of course, and then a pre-processing prior to starting any analysis. There would be the reflectance retrieval, usually a masking of um, low SNR pixels, for example. So trying to mask noise or trying to mask pixels that have a very low signal to noise ratio. Um, and it could also be a dim data dimensionality reduction, either to speed up the processing or not handle um, large data, if, depending on the processing power of um, what you're working with or it could be um, excluding bands that are dominated by noise. And this is usually followed up by um, a spectral library compilation or feature extraction, depending on the following analysis. 
And a spectral library compilation would mean um, compiling a set of reference spectra from either archive spectra, for example, from the USGS or from um, samples that you've um, scanned in the laboratory or that you scanned in the field with a handheld um, spectrometer. Um, and then the analysis depends on, or can be split up broadly into a knowledge-based, a data-driven and a hybrid of both of those. And knowledge-based approach, as the name implies, uh, relies on the knowledge of the expected spectral behavior and the feature characteristics. So we're either trying to model the different features or we're trying to isolate those features and concentrate the analysis on those. And it could be a minimum wavelength mapping or it could be a very simple band ratio depending on what kind of information you need um, for decision making, for example. And the data-driven approach relies on a reference data um, set either as training data in a training-based um, analysis or in or as an end member set for the comparison based approach where we're comparing the unknown spectrum with known spectra, uh, labeled spectra from archives or other reference data sets. So going into the Apliki mine data, uh, what you can see on the top is the um, hyperspectral data set that we took. Uh, you can see where it was taken approximately within this outcrop um, down below with the red rectangle. And um, this is an RGB, um, so true color representation of this data. And you can see the sample points in the image as well, where we were able to access this mind phase safely and actually sample. And the color coding of those sample refers to different mineral groups within these samples that I'm going into more detail later on. Um, I wanted to show one very easy knowledge-based approach um, that we can apply on this data, which is band ratios. Um, where we know the minimum of the feature and the shoulder of the feature, and we're just trying to see or trying to get an idea about the slope um, of this feature. So we can get an idea about the actual um, strength of the feature. And this is a very um, easy to start with analysis. It gives us a good overview and can give us some insight into the data. Um, the Central, central picture um, shows us the band ratio for ALOH and in the bottom we can see the MGOH and MGOH here would represent the presence of chloride in this mine phase. And you can see from the ALOH um, image that it doesn't really give us a good idea about the outcrop. It shows us that we have more um, potentially clayish minerals in the center of this outcrop which is to be expected because we see that we already have a lot of um, alteration and um, surface alteration going on in water runoff. So that um, doesn't really tell us a lot about um, the deposit. When we look at the chloride um, or MGOH um, band ratio, we can see that the stock work zone in the center is much more highlighted than the pillow lavas um, surrounding it. And we can also see that um, it actually increases towards the center so that the color coding gives us some indication of where more chloride is actually um, present. And um, so for the second approach, I did a comparison based approach and I wanted to walk you through that a little bit, especially on the um, spectral site specific spectral library that we need for the reference spectra. And here we sampled 36 different samples um, from the mind phase and um, measure them in the laboratory and then send the surface um, parts or the um, alteration on the surface actually into a geochemistry and ICPMS. And we use the um, bike geochemistry uh, of these samples to do an agglomerative bottom-up clustering, resulting in seven different geochemical clusters. So we identified seven different groups based on the geochemistry. And that was checked against the uh, mineralogy of those different samples or the dominating mineralogy um, identified, identified by XRD. And this was also confirming these seven different clusters. And then I checked the spectra of those clusters against, against each other, um, resulting in, or also confirming that here we have seven different clusters of mineral mixtures that um, are actually representing these seven different zones within our outcrop. And we built a spectral library based on these seven different clusters. 
um, that correspond with the outcrop zonation. And this was used as reference um, data sets, for example, um, for the applique pillow lavas or for um, chloritic stockwork or for areas of higher silicification. And um, this was used to map um, the outcrop and was used to map the samples as well. So we used this and tested the um, analysis approach on samples to identify if those samples are actually being identified correctly. That was the case. So we used it on the outcrop. And to validate our results, we had the different sampling points on the outcrop. And we had a map from Antivaches in 2015 um, with different zonations expected in the outcrop from a set of 66 different samples over the whole outcrop. <clears throat> And you can see the resulting analysis in the top here. Um, this is a result from a bi-triangular feature fitting. I don't want, don't want to go into detail here, um, but this was the best analysis to actually identify the stock zonation in the mine phase. And you can see that uh, we can actually identify the chloritic stock work very nicely. We can identify the weathered sulfide ore. And then uh, we have a very clear cut to the pillow lavas um, on either sides of this open um, outcrop. And comparing these two, the knowledge base and the comparison based, the knowledge base gives us a very good overview of our outcrop of our image. And um, it helps us to zone into the area of chloritic um, alteration. You can see that it corresponds with the chloritic stock work that was mapped below. And um, our comparison based approach, um, depending on our reference library, actually gives us a good idea of the um, smaller, more intricate um, alteration patterns that we can see on the surface here. So as I said, there's a lot of things you have to consider when you use uh, hyperspectra and analysis. There's a lot of different approaches that you can use, and there's different approaches that fit different um, questions that you might ask from your data. Um, and you also have to keep in mind what your algorithms can actually learn from, how validated your data sets are that you can use for learning or training. Um, if you're using laboratory samples or if you want to use regions of interest within the data of the outcrop, if you want to use archive data or if you have the potential or possibility of doing site-specific sampling and analyzing those samples. And then um, it also depends on, so what I showed you was not a mineral mapping per se, it was a mapping of mineral groups. You could also look for a mineral mapping if you're just interested in the presence of particular minerals in the outcrop or potential presence um, that could indicate contamination, for example. It could be a mapping of lithologies or um, broader groups of materials for um, drill core mapping. It could be a mapping of grade by using um, chemometrics, or it could be a mapping of contaminants. And all of this will depend on what you actually need to know to make decisions based on this data. And um, there's yeah a lot of different things that can influence that. It can depend on the calibration. It can depend on um, proxies. It can depend on um, the activity of the spectral activity of the minerals that you're interested in. So which minerals are actually spectra, uh, spectrally active in the Venian sphere range, and how can you use them to as proxies to target towards mineralization? Um, yeah, I just wanted to give an example for Cyprus, but there's some things to keep in mind. So it's not a one fits all approach, but things uh, usually aren't. Um, and just to highlight that, I want to show you an example from Skuretissa mine, um, where we did not do this mineral group mapping, but we just looked at samples and classified them based on intermediate copper grades, lower copper grades and higher copper grades. And here in Skuretissa mine, um, this is the um, Three Hills um, pit in Skuretissa mine that was west of, um, east of Apliki, sorry. And um, here we actually have a fault that is running through this open pit um, in east west, um, yeah, from, from east to west. And um, north of this fault, we're expecting lower copper grades, and south of this fault into the open pit, we're expecting higher um, copper grades. And we just built a spectral library that um, reflected our. Um, three or ternary um, classification between high copper grades, low copper grades, contaminants. And you can see that the actual uh, mapping here reflects that very well, that we can see that the yellow pixels here are actually following this fault line, and those are of more clayish origin. Um, so it makes sense to see those um, running along the fault line. And then north of this fault, we have our intermediate copper grades between 0.1 and 0.27 
percent and then into the open pit in pink you can see the highlights of having higher copper grade so we asked a very different question from this data and was actually able to show us um, this in this hyperspectral imagery very well in the distribution of those and um, the second case study I want to go into detail with a little bit is a Cuprite Nevada UAV case study from high specs. Um, just a short intro to um, the area. So Cuprite Nevada is a very typical test area for satellite and um, for satellite hyperspectral and superspectral studies. So you can find a lot of different studies um, concentrating on this area, um, especially from the USGS and most of the USGS developed um, uh, algorithm and uh, toolboxes um, concentrate on this area because it's very well characterized. And here we have two well exposed zones of advanced agilic alteration assemblages um, east and west of Highway 95. And you can see the position of um, the hyperspectral UAV study that, has, that was taken um, out um, here in the western part of this um, yeah, hill. And um, on the left, you can see the UAV study. So that has a spectra, that has a spatial resolution and pixels of around 10 centimeters. And then on the right, just to give you an overview, you can see the Sentinel-2 data um, from 2020, and that has pixels of 20 by 20 meter. So for Cuprite Nevada, um, here we have laterally extensive zones um, of opalized rock, which contain minor alunite and kaolinite. And um, the argillized areas are actually located within these zones or at their edge, where we're expecting kaolinite with um, opal and montmorillonite, um, as well as some um, mica. And um, we're here in the western part of the um, outcrop or western part of this area, where we are expecting to see potentially the propylitic phyllic and argillic zones. So we're not really seeing the mineralized um, ore bearing zones. And the flight campaign was um, taken out over 40 hectares of um, the western center of the Cooperite Hills with 20 flight lines in uh, two days with an altitude of around 100 to 200 meters. And um, as I said, we have a pixel resolution of around 10 centimeters here. Um, I just wanted to highlight again what, how the spectral alteration zones um, are actually active within the Venian sphere range. So as I said, um, some of them might not be active, but we can usually see mineralization that is typical for the propylitic, the phyllic and advanced agilic um, alteration, as well as um, carbonate iron oxides and iron oxidation state minerals. Um, and I also um, yeah, recommend this paper from Kudahi in 2016 here. Um, another thing to keep in mind is when we map um, these um, phyllic alteration zones, um, as well as kaolinite um, for alteration mapping, we actually need a very high spectral resolution. Um, so we need a spectral resolution um, over 10 nanometers of spectral sampling to identify the double features and the very narrow features that you're expecting here. And the green spectrum here on the top, this actually shows us, um, or is a typical um, kaolinite bearing spectrum where we have a double feature of um, a very a bigger double feature around 1,000, around 2,220 nanometers, and then one around 1,400. And you can see when we downsample the data, we actually lose this double feature and it is not visible to us anymore. So the differentiation between kaolinite and um, white mica, for example, would become problematic here. But with the hyperspectral resolution or the spectral resolution of um, the Mjolnir cameras from high specs, we have a sphere spectral resolution of five nanometers. So we are very well able to actually identify this. Um, here I'm showing a comparison based analysis and the feature modeling. And we're starting with a comparison based analysis with a spectral angle mapper. That's a very easy go to analysis for first impression of the imagery. All of these algorithms have advantages and disadvantages, so I'm not going to dive into the one from Spectral Angle Mapper. Just wanted to show you that when we have a spectral library, um, which is built from archive spectra from the USGS here, and compare the unknown to the known spectra, we actually get this map here on the left. And just to show you where in the deposit we are, we're expecting to have more alunitic alteration towards the west and more unaltered or argillic alteration towards the east. And this very well represented um, even when using uh, the spectral angle mapper here, 
we can see this hill dominated by alunite, um, and then the rest is more dominated by argillic and white mica. Um, and because we talked about multispectral before, I want to give a comparison of what the multispectral analysis of this um, area would look like and what the hyperspectral um, higher resolution can offer. Um, just to show the differences in pixel size um, on top of each other. So here we have the 20 by 20 meter pixels from Sentinel-2 data and the 10 centimeter pixels from um, the UAB data. And um, we can already see that a lot of detail is being lost visually. So we already lose a lot of information um, for different um, spatial patterns that we could see. But it also means that um, we have very, very big mixed pixels in the Sentinel-2 suite. So material that is mixed um, within one pixel um, will give us a very different reflectance spectrum. And sometimes some mineralogy or vegetation dominates the spectrum and makes it harder to see um, mineralization that we're actually interested in. So just to keep this mixed pixel problem uh, in mind, especially when we're looking at um, satellite data. Um, and here I wanted to show you the direct difference between an aster spectrum and the high spec spectrum or hyperspectral spectrum. So on the left, you can see the spectral resolution of aster in the plot of this reference spectral library. And we can see that we don't have a lot of information in the veneer. So 400 to 1000 nanometers is um, practically flat. And then we get some differences in alteration in the sphere. So we can see differences in these minerals here after 2000 nanometers. And um, in the high specs um, spectrum, you can see a lot more differentiation and we are actually able to resolve different features, which means we're able to distinguish between the different materials more clearly. And um, on the bottom, you can see on the right, again, the analysis that I already showed you, what the hyperspectrum shows us, what we expect, that we have alunite towards the west and then more monoelite uh, mixtures towards the east. And when I analyze, when I downsample our hyperspectral data to the Aster spectral setup without mixing the pixels and creating big, bigger pixels, just changing the spectral fingerprints or the spectral um, resolution to that of Aster, you can see that the map um, already gives us a very, very different picture and not really highlighting this presence of alunite anymore because with the Aster data, we're not able to distinguish between those different spectra. They just look different and it's not possible to um, concentrate on that. So just to keep that in mind, and on top of that, then Asta would have these 30 by 30 meter pixels that you can see in red here on the corner. So we already lose a lot of information. Um, yeah. And the last, last thing I want to go into is the spectral feature modeling. Um, here we are looking at a minimum wavelength modeling, which means we want to know about the differences of the minimum of the feature position um, and the depth of this feature. And um, here we're looking at very intricate changes because substitution of elements within different minerals can change the feature to actually um, just move a couple of nanometers over. And that can be interesting if we want to look for mica alteration, for example, from muscovite to fengite or something like that. Um, so here we are modeling the feature. And um, we can model more than one feature where we model the position and strength of the feature, um, feature one, feature two, feature three, that we can see in this um, imagery. And for, um, for the Cooprite UAV scan, just wanted to show you. So a feature one here in green and then feature number two, feature number three, feature number four. Um, and it's um, showing a color coding of the position, minimum position of this feature. Um, in wavelengths, in nanometers, and the strength by brightness. So the brighter it is, the stronger this feature actually is. And when we just look at one feature that has been modeled, we can see that we don't really see a lot of differences here. The whole area seems to be dominated by ALOH, so around 2,200 nanometers. Could be clay, could be mica, but it doesn't give us a lot of information or distinction of the area. But as soon as we look into um, the second feature, we can see a clear east-west distinction between two different materials um, in this imagery. And uh, the third feature actually reveals the presence of um, something going on in the west here, which was mapped as alunite before, where we see that we have um, our wider feature here before 2150 nanometers. Um, and then the last uh, image just highlights that feature three, or in this case, the fourth feature, um, the fourth deepest feature that has been modeled, 
uh, actually doesn't have a very high strength. So that's why it's been shown in this very dark color. So it can represent what we can see in this um, hyperspectral data by modeling three features and distinguishing between three different features. Yeah, and that was um, my presentation. If you want to chat about hyperspectral geology, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to engage. And um, yeah, I've gone way over time, so I will stop talking now. Thank you. Thank you, Frederica. Very interesting talk. Um, uh, so we just have uh, some questions coming up. Uh, um, maybe, um, so about the, the spectral libraries, um, Jan Karstens has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting and very impressive, actually, what this uh, technology is uh, possible even to uh, achieve here in this uh, case that you presented to us. Thank you very much. And yeah, my question would be, it was, of course, very impressive what you can do with this high specs, very sophisticated technology. But there is already a lot of data out there that are actually public and open and used for free. So me personally, I'm curious, actually, is it possible to use those public libraries such as the USGS one, for instance? I think it's one of the best known and also one of the biggest, actually, of uh, spectral libraries. Is it possible to use those in, for instance, freeware software like QGIS and to differentiate different rock types with those libraries? Or that's something too, too ahead of the time at the moment. Do you know about this? Yeah, no, absolutely. You can use the USGS archive library spectra. They're very well characterized. So you can, if you go on the USGS website, um, you also see the different analysis that were done on the minerals and what grain size it was uh, measured in. So you can get a little bit of an idea of what you're actually comparing with. Um, so I usually use the USGS archives as well if I want to do a mineral mapping. Mm -hmm. It depends a little bit because the USGS archives, they usually have um, powdered minerals and they usually have pure minerals. Mm -hmm. the, um, the metadata to the um, USGS archive tells you something about the pureness of the spectrum. So if you're expecting to have a pure mineral, there could be some side effects from other mineralization. It's a good indicator. Um, when I use it for outcrop mineralogy, I'm a bit careful because we are usually not mapping pure minerals, but mineral mixtures, Obviously, yeah. but it could be a good indicator. So if you want to map the presence of white mica in an outcrop or in an overflight, you can use that definitely to, to indicate for the presence of that. And um, for QGIS, uh, I know that there are not a lot of um, actual toolboxes out there to work with QGIS. The NGeoMap has a toolbox that can be integrated into um, QGIS to do that. And you can load a spectral library and compare it with. Um, that's from the GeoSet as well. Um, so there is something that you can add to QGIS, but I usually recommend using Python toolboxes that are open and free. Um, but I'm happy to, when this is posted on YouTube, I'm happy to just add some comments with links to different Python toolboxes that can Thank be used. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, may I ask you uh, as a following question, what software are you using or is it something uh, internal that you actually program to analyze and also modify the spectra as in your last mm. uh, uh, part of the talk now? Yeah, um, I'm using a mix of different Python toolboxes and then our own Recents Plus software, depending on what I want to look at. And we are using Predictera, which is a chemometric software with uh, high specs, where we're more looking at um, PLS um, mapping uh, or yeah, modeling of different grades. I suppose it's a paid by content uh, software. Yeah, so Predictera has a license and Envy also has a license that's not eligible. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are some very good Python toolboxes out there. And one is from the uh, University of Freiberg, which is called Highlight. You can post that in the chat here because this gives you a lot of um, yeah, input for your first start. And the um, guy who programmed it, Sam Thiele, actually has a lot of uh, Jupyter notebooks out there. So you can already start playing with data. This, okay, this thank you very fun. much. Yeah. That's a good hint. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, thank you. Um, maybe I just have one question about um, the different uh, ratios of um, of minerals. Can you tell that with uh, hy hyperspectral imagery? Um, yeah, so for band ratios, that's usually something done for satellite data, for multispectral data, because we don't have the ability to model this data very well. 
because mm -hmm. we don't have that many data points to work with. So for Sentinel, we have nine data points. We have nine bands that we can use in the Venian sphere. Um, and modeling based on that is not as straightforward as having consecutive narrow bands in hyperspectra, where you would usually look at a modeling of features instead of the band ratios. But there's a website with um, a lot of different indices for different um, applications. It's called indexdatabase.de. Um, um, and you can check what kind of indexes you can use, um, for example, to map Gaussians in satellite data, and it uh, gives you different um, wavelengths or bands for this index, uh, for these indices, depending on the different satellites you can work with and the data that is out there. Um, for the band ratios in hyperspectral, that's just a very broad idea of trying to, I know that kaolinite is active around 2150 and 2200 nanometers. So I'm trying to model the slope between the left shoulder and the center. It's not the best indicator, well, it's an indicator, but it's not the best mapping approach because um, other minerals don't have this one um, very specific feature, but they are um, characterized by more than one feature. So um, chloride has two features and only by the presence of those two features, we can say, well, this is, or this is chloride instead of um, kaolinite or something else. So modeling one feature or doing a band ratio for one feature works if you have this one characteristic feature that you want to look at. Okay, thank you. Else, I would like to post another question. Uh, how would be the workflow actually for you at high specs? You would first go into the field, take the UAV and the head samples, or you start with a big broad image with the satellite images of ASTA or comparable? Uh, mm. uh, um, yeah. That's a good question. I mean, with high specs, we usually don't get a lot of um, requests for satellite data because we're concentrating on the um, hyperspectral data. And there's not a lot of hyperspectral satellites out there. NMAP is being launched now-ish. And we have Prisma um, from Italy. And there's going to be more hyperspectral satellites um, coming up. But that's not really data that is very, um, very accessible right now for satellite data. For, for high specs as a workflow, Either we get um, clients request for very specific questions to model um, specific element content within a smaller ranges of samples or content, or we get samples to identify the presence of contaminants, for example, in um, carbonate uh, mining or something like that. Um, and there we usually start with a feasibility study in the laboratory where we are getting samples and we try to characterize the samples, try to figure out what camera actually fits the purpose best. You don't need to use Venia and Sphere for every application. Sometimes Sphere is enough. Sometimes you only need Venia if you're looking at iron ore, for example. Um, and then if we have a good model from our lab data, we would apply it to the field. And that could either be by using UAV or could be by downsampling the data that we have to the UAV data. And when we work in the field, we have to keep in mind that we're losing information outside of the atmospheric windows because some of the... Um, information will be masked by the atmospheric water. Um, so we have to keep in mind that the modeling that we do in the laboratory also have to, has to work when we don't have access to this wavelength ranges because of atmospheric masking. But it would be an upscaling from the laboratory to the, to the field. Okay, it's usually what I'm, I'm most comfortable with. Okay, you go from the smallest detail then to the broader picture instead of vice versa. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, we had, a, we had a demo in uh, a couple of weeks ago in Arizona. And there we didn't have any samples. We just looked at the uh, UAV data of an open pit copper mine uh, with a SCARN deposit. And there we just concentrated on um, trying to narrow down on the actual um, carbonate content and also content of um, gerocyte. So we know that we have some pyrite and depending on when the pyrite reacts on the surface, we get different secondary um, iron. That can be a good indicator too. And uh, may I follow up on this? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt someone else in the question process, but uh, is it possible then to apply this also to uh, greenfield studies? I mean, you're working now mainly in open pit stuff, so very easy accessible with the spectral cameras, actually. So what if there's a land cover in between or maybe a little forest or something? Yeah, so that's a big problem for using satellite, for example, especially in Europe, if we have very well vegetated areas, we just get vegetation in the spectral signal. So that's not going to help a lot. When we look at semi-arid areas where we have like these little bushes and we, we can still see the ground between those um, vegetation spots. 
we can use the UAV data very well to actually do that. So that's why we opt to, to UAV data because then we can actually look through the vegetation, mm -hmm. not through, but between the vegetation. Um, yeah. So then it's, then it's possible to do that, but for, I wouldn't go into the rainforest to do, to use hyperspectrum unless you want to classify the trees. <laughs> okay, good point. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thank you. So no the questions. So uh, I think you're, you're, you're very clear with the, with your work. So I want to thank you very much, Frederica, for, for giving us this talk and uh, for all the participants to join. And um, so hopefully you can all uh, join for this. For in a few hours, we will have another talk. It's on using tourmalin as vectoring for porphyry deposits. Yeah, Bill Fisher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederike, and uh, hope to see you all soon. See you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Thank Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Thanks so much.